Hi, my name is Joe Simperman. I'm the president of Global Cleveland, and I'm thrilled to be on this amazing RTA bus drive. And I'm here with John Grabowski from the Cleveland Western Reserve Historical Society slash Case Western Reserve University. What we're doing today is a RTA bus ride through Cleveland's neighborhoods to talk about the history of immigration, the present day of immigration, and the future of immigration. And John Grabowski is gonna be our guide and our narrator as we make our way through Cleveland's greatest neighborhoods on Cleveland's greatest public transit service, the RTA. And we're thrilled to be able to tell a story. When you look out the window, the world is all around us. So John, you were saying a little bit earlier about the ways in which people learned about what was happening in Cleveland. You said it revolved around jobs. It's basically jobs. You know, people, you know, today people, you know, refugees come to Cleveland because they can't go back and this gives them a safe haven. But in the 19th century, the bulk of people came to Cleveland for jobs, for improvement. Now, certainly if you were Jewish and coming from the shtetls, you were looking for something beyond jobs. You were looking for fair treatment and safety. Uh, and if you were Irish, you were fleeing a, a dead economy. But you know, by the you know, early part of the 20th century, when, when we look at the first immigrants coming to Cleveland, the first group that comes to Cleveland are the Irish. Uh, and, you know, Cleveland is a Protestant community. That's why we have a public square with a church on it, et cetera, and so forth. So the Irish come and they are part of the crew that helps dig the Ohio and Erie Canal, which transforms Cleveland in from, a, you know, sort of a mercantile little community into a growing community. And so the Irish are here and then they're followed by the Germans. And many of the Germans are moving because of revolutionary movements in Germany in the 1830s and 1840s. And, and essentially the other thing that is, is pushing people out of Europe is a growing population, the industrialization of Europe, the cutting up of farms, that families don't have as much land as they used to as they inherit the farms. Uh, and so there's a population pressure that's moving them. They'll find a job. They have relatives back home. They'll send a letter back home, mm. you know, saying, you know, I have a job at such and such. I know the foreman. I can get you a job. Come and join me. And that will bring people in in a chain of migration, which, which is essentially the thing that creates the neighborhoods that we're all familiar with. And, you know, each of these communities has its halls. It has its churches. Some of those churches are still active. Uh, you know, it depends if the congregation has stayed robust enough. Other the churches have changed. We're looking at Cleveland right now, which by the turn of the 20th century uh, was a city of roughly 300,000 people, seventh largest city in the United States. 1910, it is the sixth largest city in the United States. 1920, Cleveland is the fifth largest city in the United States, population of over 800,000. Two thirds of it of foreign birth or foreign parentage. Two thirds yeah. of our greatest population number were foreign born. Yeah, or foreign parentage. Or foreign parentage. Right. And another 35,000 in 1920 were African Americans who were coming up in the Great Migration huh. of the South. And, and one of the things that happens in Cleveland in the 19th century is, is that if you were a smart foreman in a mill, and, uh, and let's, let's say your, your Irish workers went on strike, and this happens at the rolling mills, then you, you look at the next group that come in who have no association with the Irish or some antipathy to it, and you bring them in. So the Poles come in. And so there's a rift between the Poles and the Irish and Slavic village. St. Aloysius, is, it's a beautiful church, and, and St. Aloysius actually starts and serves a generally immigrant Catholic community, and now it serves an African American Catholic uh -huh. community. And what's interesting, I was looking at a picture of the inside of St. Aloysius. Now they have they had posters inside of African Americans who are on their road to sainthood. Wow. And so there is a contingent of African Americans who are Catholic. Yes. Some of them would have come from Louisiana and they continue the, the, the religion here. So, you know, the religions shift and change. It's, it's interesting because, you know, when Moses Cleveland started Cleveland, he expected this to be a small New England town. So, John, you know, yeah. um, Cleveland's got so many different cultures and, and religions. We have such a strong and vibrant Jewish community. Yep. And we're on East 105th Street, East yep. 105, right. Rabbi Silver, the story of the foundation of Israel. Yep. Here we are in the middle of yep. Cleveland. Yeah, it's interesting because we're, we're looking at, you know, as we we're talking, this was supposed to be a Protestant community, it became a Protestant Catholic community. And in 1839, the first organized Jews, uh, group of Jews come to Cleveland. In 1839, 39, the first yeah. Jewish immigrants. Yeah, well, there were Jews here before, but the first large group okay. is led by Moses Alsbacher. It's drawn here by Simpson Thorman. Simpson Thorman's a really interesting person. 
and they bring enough Jews to establish a minion. They bring a shokot and a moil so they can have ritual slaughter and circumcisions done. And so the, that's when the Jewish community starts. It really begins to grow in the latter 19th century, particularly with the persecutions, the pogroms in the Russian Empire. Now, this, this is the church. We should stop here just for a second because this is incredibly important. This is, this is uh, Antje Emeth, the Cleveland Jewish Center. Uh, and it, it's a Jewish center. It has a school, it has a gymnasium, and it has a pool. Malcolm X is here. Dr. King is here Dr. at court. King is here. here, yeah. So you're looking, and when Dr. King and Stokes were here, this street was jammed with people. You know, this is one of the stories of a transition of a structure, a religious structure, from yeah. one religion to another. There are connections between those religions. And I think that's one of the things that you have to get used to. You know, people wonder about the changes that are happening in the world, new immigrants coming from other areas. It's happened before. Yeah. It's happened before. You know, when your ancestors came from Slovenia, mine came from Slovenia, they were grinders. Yeah. They were workers. You know, were they problem makers? Yeah, maybe they were. Yeah. So, you know, you see that reaction when there's a shift. And when we talk about African-Americans in Cleveland, you're right, we're talking about people who have been in this nation since 1619. And, and so we're, we're looking at a large part of American history. The war is over. And in the early 1920s, Leo Weidenthal, Jenny Zwick, who is a Jewish lady, and Charles Wolfram, who is German, decide that they want to do a series of gardens that honor other cultures. And so they set up the Cultural Gardens League, which becomes the Cultural Gardens Federation. And I forget the exact the date, they, the first new garden they establish is the Hebrew Garden. And the Hebrew Garden actually evolves into a, a set, sort of a center for Zionism, uh, looking toward bringing the Jewish community together in in, in what would be Palestine at that point. The second garden to be established, I believe two years later, is the German garden. Now, I find that fascinating because the, the German garden is established like eight years after the end of World War I, when the Germans were the worst things on the face of the earth. And the first statue that goes there is one of Goethe and Schiller. Now that statue had already been in Wade Park in 1907. It is then given to a community if the community has the wherewithal and the plan to build the garden. The garden has to be built by the community. Uh, the gardens really begin to take off during the 1930s with the WPA. There's a lot of WPA funding that goes into it. Mm. So by the time of the First World War, you have a long series of gardens, most of them on the east side, what is now MLK Boulevard, and the Ukrainian garden on, on the, on the uh, west side that the gardens are morbid because they are caught in between two changing neighborhoods, Huff on the west side of the drive and Glenville. And you have the Huff Rebellion, Huff Riots in 1966, the Glenville shootout in 1969, and the gardens become almost a no-go zone. So if we look at the gardens today, there are 33 of them. Wow. So now we're, we're, we're on East Boulevard. Uh, you're looking at the better houses on East Boulevard on on the right side of the bus and on the left side of the bus, we're gonna be seeing the cultural gardens as they come up. And this is the American Cultural Garden. That's the Mark Twain statue there. And the next garden that we'll see will be the Hebrew Garden, which was the first one started after the Shakespeare Garden was started. And called Hebrew because Israel didn't yes, exist. No, Israel. So it's the Hebrew Garden and it celebrated writers who worked in Hebrew and, uh, and it celebrated pioneers who worked, worked for the preservation of Jewish culture. Basically, those immigration laws in 1921 and 1924 said those people from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe didn't have the cultural smarts to become Americans. And so what these gardens do is they celebrate the pioneers of culture in a variety of nationalities. And I think it says to the country, we've got those too. You know, one thing we didn't talk about, John, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of putting this out there, but there's uh, an iconic American uh, fund uh, figure whose roots are really in anti-fascism who came from this community which is the story of Superman yeah yeah and and two Jewish kids Good. trying yeah. to figure out the world, world. Yep. do this fun 
iconoclastic figure, figure yeah. but there's a little bit of a story there. Yeah, Siegel and Schuster are, are you know, they're, they're living, they're growing up in a period where anti-Semitism is rife. They're in Glenville, which is a largely Jewish community, and, and they're looking at, they're looking for something. They're talented kids, and they come up with Superman. And, you know, Superman becomes, if you look at the World War II versions yes. of Superman, he is battling Hitler constantly. Yes. Yeah. But the other side of World War II, of course, is the Japanese community. Yes. So the, the, the Japanese citizens yeah. who were unjustly yeah. interned, interned right. by our own racist government, our government are now resettled here in Cleveland. Cleveland. Right. Yeah. And I, one of my favorites is the late Henry Tanaka. Uh, and Henry Tanaka was a member of one of the leaders of the Japanese American Citizens League. Genealogy really began in the United States in the 1880s and 1890s when people wanted to trace their ancestry to the first settlers or to the revolution. Ah. Why? Because it set them apart from the new people. So it's a in. status issue. It's a status issue. But then you get Alex Haley with Roots and, and you get the ethnic revival in 1970s, so you now have a Slovenian genealogy society, a Polish genealogy society. Everybody's doing it. They're looking for something that sets them apart in a world that really wants to homogenize you. Now we're going past, where you see it out uh, the bus window, uh, St. Vitus Church, yes. which is, I would say, the last grand ethnic church built in Cleveland. It's the Slovenian mother parish here. And in this in this neighborhood, which um, the factory jobs are still here, mm -hmm. and the neighborhood continues to churn, churn right, yeah. and and we're approaching, you know, leaving the Eastern European, Germanic, Irish Jewish side, Jewish. the Jewish, African American Jewish. migration, Jewish. and we're about to enter into what was called when I was a kid Chinatown, Town, right, and it's now been properly renamed Asia Town. So yeah, we we just went past uh, St. Paul's Croatian Church, as we're on entering 40th Street, Asia, okay, Asia Town, yep. And, and we're going to go on to Asia Town, Payne Avenue. And you were talking about that. And, and when it, here we are in Asia Town, when you look at yeah. the streets, yeah. the, there's different languages on the oh, street, street signs, signs yeah. that reflect the Vietnamese, East, Japanese, yeah. Korean, Korean yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Chinese. It, it's, yeah. 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 And you get into Chinese versus Taiwanese. Yes. You can get into the politics of the yes. issues too. Yes. So there's a diversity here. And, and for my students at CWRU, if they're going out dining, this is where they come now. Oh, sure. You know, you're, you're looking at bagels which is like, you know, Jewish food all over. So like Brugger's bagels, Brugger's, Einstein yeah, yeah. bagels. And, and, you know, Chinese food now, Italian food yes. now. It's, and I think there's something there in, in a way, you know, we love to watch people dance. We love to eat their yes. food. Do we love them? I knew that the Asian Indian community had arrived when Southgate Shopping Center had a Sari Mahal ah. where they sold authentic Asian Indian food. You knew yes. there were enough Asian Indians here at that yes. time to make it a go. To support it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, in, you know, sometimes given who my ancestry, I'm stuck in the past lane, you know, Ellis Island immigrants. That's different. This is a different world. This is a world where everybody's moving now. I do a lot of lectures for groups in Cleveland, leadership groups and so forth. And the people I'm lecturing to are newbies in Cleveland. Many of them are. And, uh, and I think that's good because they come with a different perspective. Old line Clevelanders like myself have a perspective that it's inherited from generation to generation. That's fine too. But these are people who see the city with new eyes and they interpret it in a different way. And I think that's good. Cleveland has always been connected someplace else. Uh, and, you know, goods would come in from the East Coast and European goods would come over. One of the things I find fascinating is that some of the early financial collapses in the United States came because of the need for American grain in Europe would fall and, and farmers would have a problem or American investments in Europe would go bad or Europeans who had invested in American railroads would pull their money out. Economically, we're, we're always been joined to a global system. We're in downtown Cleveland. We're past the mall, the great progressive era of uh, creation in the city. We're yes. going to go up to Public Square now. And uh, this section of the corner here of Ontario and St. Clair 
this is where the first Chinese community I had no been. idea. Yeah, it was small because, and you're looking at the steeple of Old Stone Church. Yeah. So, but the original Chinatown neighborhood was, was here. right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the church was built on the square because it's of a, our New England New, roots. Yeah, it's, it's natural, yeah. Uh-huh. And it's you know, the church is interesting because it actually comes out of a Sunday school that met in the log courthouse in Public Square. Uh, I've had two different dates, 1819 uh, or 1820. And, and the first church was built here, completed in 1833. It was a stone church and that was torn down. This church was built in the 1850s and it survived two fires and two rebuildings. Wow. Uh, and and it is a, it's a fixture of, and we're looking at the cultural community here. This is Cleveland's public square. Right. And we're coming up on a figure, Tom Johnson. Tom Johnson, though, one of the most radical mayors we ever had. Uh, uh, four-term mayor, 1901-1909. He challenged what he called privilege in the city. He wanted a publicly owned transit system to charge a three-cent fare. So this bus that we're on right now yeah. has some... Some connection gra- to that. And some because, gratitude to, to this idea yeah, of a public I mean, transit. A public transit, right. Yeah. And here's the terminal tower, right. which at one point was one of the tallest structures in it's, the continental yeah, United States. Yeah, it's the tallest building outside of New York City until the 1960s. Wow. And I think it was Boston that built a building that was taller. I may be mistaken sure. on that. And this was part of the railroad legacy of but, Cleveland. Yeah, and it was built by the Van Swearingen's, and the Van Swearingen's were the uh, the guys who made Shaker Heights an exclusive suburb. So as we're here now in the heart of downtown, which is still a job center. Yeah. We, we are sitting right now in an area that was called the Haymarket District. This was the Haymarket. This was the Haymarket District, where the farmers brought their goods in along Kinsman. The original farmer's market. Market here, right. And, uh, and it grew up before the terminal. It was ramshackle. There were houses down the hill on streets called Hill, Mincon, and Berg. There were no bathrooms. It was one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. Uh, this is where the Sheriff Street Market and the Central Market were, and, and now we're looking at a sports complex here. And there was a Lebanese community nearby, Yeah, right? Lebanese, yeah, on Bolivar, on Bolivar. There's Lebanese community, and then you have St. Uh, St. Marin's Church, which is a Syrian Maronite church there. There's a Greek community. Early Turks lived down here as well. The Turks, the Lebanese, and the Syrians, Syrians were down here. Right yeah. here. Yeah, and the Italians. And the Italians. Because Big Italy was here. Big Italy. Big Italy was here. Big yeah. Italy versus Little, Little Italy. Italy. John, yeah. what is that? Uh, it's I don't I can't trace the name of Big Italy, but that's the first place the Italians settled. And so the church, you know, at St. Mary's Church, that was St. Anthony's. That was the first Italian parish in Cleveland. Really? Yeah. And then it, they Pre went, Aladdin's Pita Bakery next yeah, door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's where they started. And many of them were green grocers. They they worked in. So if you're looking at Italian American grocery stores yeah. now. There are a lot of Italians who were pushcart vendors or they had a stall in the market. Now, we're on the Hope Memorial Bridge and the Guardians here are You're, big. I'm, I'm sensing a Tom Hanks voiceover in your uh, voice yeah, right no, now. Tom, the Guardians are here. These are the Guardians of Traffic. And uh, and they're, they're iconic statues. They're, they're Art Deco. They're modern. Uh, and the, the bridge was designed by Walker and Weeks. And uh, Herring was the sculptor of these statues. And as we now know, the new name of the Cleveland baseball team is the Guardians. And, uh, and not having the records, who do you think did the work on the bridge? We, we know that, the, well, the Guardians we know were done by Ohio Cut Stone, which is in Little Italy. Most of the stone cutters there were Italian, but Bob Hope's father was English. I just got an email from a guy who has a picture of the stone cutters and said that's his father and his name is Thomas Campbell. He's a Scottish immigrant. So these were immigrant stone cutters, uh-huh. Italians, uh, English, and it's, and Scottish that we know so far who cut the stone for the guardians. Wow. So I mean this this bridge and the thing that's magical about this bridge is it doesn't have an over superstructure. Yes. So when you're on the bridge, you can look down the valley. Yes. And you can see the Rockside Road on a clear day. Yes. And you can look up the valley. And, and to our left, you have the, the steel mills. Steel mills, the right. Thing, the jobs that continue, the railroads. Right, yeah, roads, right, you yeah. Know, just over the, the bridge, right, you can yeah. see the domes of Greek Annunciation, Orthodox oh, Church. Church, right. And, and then you can see what used to be Duck Island. Yes. And, uh, which is now being just built up into mega structures. Yes. Uh, and so these, these were places that people didn't want to live when the mills were down below. And now they have the best views of the valley. Huh. So Tremont does the same thing. It has transitioned from a steel mill, yes. working class community to 
a community where you're getting the best foodie in the food community in Cleveland yes. and, you know, high level living. And the best places are on the edge of the valley. And Tremont, which was Polish and Greek right. and Syrian and Ukrainian. And, right. And what we ought to remember is that river down there is a reminder of the first people. The river was the reminder of the first, first people. people. It's Cuyahoga, Native American name, and that we cannot forget that for about 9,000 years, there was a Native American presence, very small. Later on, closer to the European intersection during the Whittlesea period, there were communities that were established along the streams that fed into the Cuyahoga. You know Mound School, Mound Avenue? Why is it named Mound? It's a Native American mound there. I had no idea. So there is, when we talk about immigration to the city, there is a deeper history here that goes back millennia. Here we are at the West Side Market. This market is designed by one of the best architectural firms in Cleveland, Abel and Benish. Hmm. They were known as Mr. Wade's Architects, okay? And uh, so the, the building is probably the most beautiful market building in the United States, yes. I would say that. What's interesting about the West Side Market is if you've shopped here for years, you could see the change of ethnic Cleveland. Mm. So when I first encountered this market, it was all kielbasa and sausage. Mm. I can buy foods from Asia. So it, it, it is a, a rally, the Mexican food. food. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is all. Yeah, this is where we're looking at West Side of Cleveland. It's the home to most of our Latinx population sure. now. So it, it, it is that. And uh, and it's, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting transition because you had the Central Sheriff Street markets on the other side of the bridge, the West Side Market. On the here. east side. Yeah on, the, yeah, on the east side of the market, east side of the river. And what's what's fascinating about it, and the Puerto Ricans were not the first Spanish-speaking group to come to Cleveland. The first group was Mexicans. Really? Yeah. And uh, the Mexicans came, w one of the revolutions we never hear about is the Mexican Revolution, which lasted from 1910 up to around 1920. And that put many Mexicans in motion. Huh. And they crossed the border. And th there was no border for them. Right. You know, okay. Right. There was no border patrol until the 1920s. Right. There were no papers. The papers no. Right. And, and some of them would end up picking crops and fruit uh, in the Southwest. Others got jobs on the railroads as track workers. Huh. They followed the railroads up to Chicago. They ended up in the steel mills in Chicago and in Gary, Indiana. And some of them ended up in the steel mills of Lorraine. And we know by the 1920s, they were in Cleveland. Uh, living in that Woodland Avenue area. Wow, the Mexican you're, you're, community. You're community yeah. Wow. So here we are on Lorraine. On Lorraine, West Side. Right west Side, uh, uh, a main artery of the West Side, a main thoroughfare for the immigrants. Mm -hmm. We just left the West Side Market, yeah. and here we are in the heart of Ohio City. Right, yeah. It was a separate city of Ohio was incorporated in 1836, like three days before Cleveland got its Articles of Incorporation. Three days. Three days, yeah. A little animosity between the two cities. But, Not uh, anymore, though. Uh, no, but you know they it merged with Cleveland in 1854. You know, and th we talk about East Side, West Side in Cleveland, and it's really easy to go from the East Side to the West Side now. You have bridges and whatever else. You have to put yourself in the flat Sunday and look across that wide divide. Yes. And imagine coming down in a horse and wagon or walking down the hill, going over a bridge yes. or waiting for the ship, then going. It was difficult until yes. they built the first high-level bridge, the you know, first Detroit uh, Superior Bridge in the 1870s, late 1870s, early 1880s. Uh, so this, this area was, uh, was Brooklyn Township, and it was populated by New Englanders at first, and, and then the Irish came in, uh, at Irish Town Bend. The Germans came in large numbers, so it, and the area grew. And if we were going on Franklin Avenue, you see all these fantastic homes. And these were, a lot of them were for wealthy Germans, second generation or first generation, the Wiedemann families who did wholesale groceries built homes. So they, they basically had, you know, made money and were living here. Uh, other groups would come in as, as immigration changed as it did on the east side, it changed on the west side as well. So as we go out this route, you know, we're eventually going to go past another Italian community, Our Lady of Mount Carmel West. Uh, we're going to go past what was a Romanian community. Uh, we'll go past a lot more Irish stuff and we'll go past Irish churches. So this is a very diverse area. Uh, Ohio City is, I guess, one of the first places that really fell into uh, the restoration mode in the 1960s. Uh, I think one of the things was because it had more brick homes that were intact. 
And so it's been undergoing restoration as we go down here further. I mean, this whole structure here has been built brand new. This is the Spanish American Community uh, Committee, uh, which is one of the major organizations with the sort of pan, pan Latinx community here uh, that represents them. Uh, down another street here, one of the best churches in Cleveland. The interior is absolutely fantastic. Uh, St. Stephen's Church, St. Stephen's. Yeah, just just fantastic. German, yeah, German, yeah, uh, ganz Deutsch, mm -hmm. and uh, so th there's a lot of Germania here. But right now, Latinx is mm -hmm. is really the way the community is moving, mm -hmm. but it's also becoming largely gentrified. There are a lot of young people coming here. Gentrified comes from the word gentry. And, and what happens is somebody will discover an old town area that has great architecture, a great view. The prices are affordable, cheap. They'll restore it and, and other people will come. So you get people who have, they're making more money. They're putting a lot of money into it. And as they restore it, the community begins to look better. There are shops and so forth that cater to them. That's all fine. But what happens is the real estate price values go up and it carries the other properties there. So if you have an old grandmother who is living on a pension, suddenly her real estate tax bill goes up and the question is whether she can live there or not. So there are two sides to gentrification. Gotcha. We're going past St. Coleman's Church now, which is an Irish congregation, but it's best known because we have a number of African refugees. Ha. And this church has been a home for people. So the Irish kind of, and then the Congolese. Congolese, yeah. Wow. You know, so, that's another aspect, you know, if, if we're looking at black in Cleveland, yes. what does black mean? Yes. And, and so as we, we look at Nigerians yes. and Ghanaians, Ethiopians. You know, Ethiopians coming to Cleveland. Yes. This, this is another aspect of, you know, the incredible mosaic yeah of the city. let alone our sisters and brothers from Jamaica. Right. Yeah. And Haiti yeah, right. and, and the, yeah. the, the Afro-Caribbean. Right. Yeah. And which, which gets to a point, you know, these boxes that we're talking about. These monoliths you, that monoliths, you were you, you demolishing. Need, you need to find, you know, the separate identities to yes. understand they're there. And I think, you know, I say this when I talk to leadership groups, it's particularly important if you're a manager yeah. in a business that, that you get to know who your staff is. They're not just black, they're not just Asian. Right, right. We're coming up to the corner of West 65th and uh, Detroit. And for me, it's fascinating because this is Ray Pianca's corner. Judge Ray Pianca, may he rest in peace yeah. as he still lives with us. Yeah. He saved that building with the yes. Capitol Theater. But this is one of the few street corners in urban Cleveland that still has four corners that are not, one of the corners is not a, not a drugstore yes. or it's not a gasoline or station. Or a parking lot. Or a parking yes. lot. And so this this gives you a sense of what the city, and it's the new theater district for the city, right. really. It's And with people like Matt yeah. Zone and Jenny Spencer yeah. and the community that, mm -hmm. that Cleveland Public Theater, yeah, Raymond right. Bobkin yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Stephanie Herbick, it just became this yeah. place. Yeah. And you've got the new LGBTQ yes. center over here. Yes. Yeah. And you know, Seven uh, runs that really well. Yes, right. so. yes. Yeah, the Historical Society has an LGBTQ archive. You know, we're about to uh, come up to uh, the mosque, yes. and people don't realize we have one of the, the fastest growing mosques, to your point, in Cleveland, yeah, yeah. which is Somali Bantu. Yeah. And, and John, to your point earlier, that it doesn't really matter who's coming, it's just people are still coming. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're still making their way here. Yeah, and, and it is because, and I don't say this, you know, as a patriotic, it's they they see an opportunity so they, something they see, is still working there's something working yeah yeah but you know we're not the only place where people are going so if you go to the gulf states of qatar yes. and so forth there are hundreds of thousands of migrants going there and working as well so you know they're they're looking for jobs we're, we're looking again at a world in which many parts are challenged by global warming yes they're they're challenged by war yes. by genocide there, there are, you know, people are moving. They're trying to find a safe way to be, yes, to to, to earn a living, to be a human being. It couldn't be more appropriate. Uh, immediately to our uh, behind us is the Catholic Charities Refugee yeah. Resettlement, Resettlement Center, Center right? yeah. which 
knock on wood, is yeah. going to see yeah. uh, a big part of the 1,500 more people coming, coming next up. year yeah. versus last year. Yeah, I was uh, I was a member of the Board of International Services Center for so a while. So another inc yeah. stellar refugee resettlement yeah. agency. Yeah, they, they merged now with the uh, USICR. Yes, right? and then the third, Us Together, which is through HIAS, through the Jewish Federation. Yes, right. We have three amazing partners. That's right. You know, but if we talk about revolutions, you know, the, the, the German intellectuals, the free thinking intellectuals who came over after the revolution of 1848, they turned up here. Yeah. Jacob Mueller, who is an ancestor of Werner Mueller, uh, was was a journalist. He ran a newspaper cleaning, ended up being uh, somebody uh, who ended up being a, a diplomat. But these guys came over with different ideas and they were one of the reasons that a lot of the German population before and during the Civil War was anti-slavery because they they came with sort of an open, free, with free thinking mind, and, and they found slavery abhorrent. So you found a lot of German backing for Lincoln. Wow. Yeah. As we're as we're getting closer to Lorraine now, um, you know we do really see uh, 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 the immigrant waves from. Uh, uh, the Middle East, yeah. um, you know, clearly Lebanese, clearly Palestinian, yeah. Jordanian. There's a new restaurant, the Yemeni Gate, mm -hmm. uh, the Damascus Gate, these yeah. places that suggest it. And there's also a great um, uh, Mexican uh, taqueria. Yeah. And, and it's kind of this whole amalgam, yeah. but it really does seem like uh, the heart of, of um, uh, Arabic culture or uh, Arabic speaking culture would be in this area. Yeah. And, and is there any like what was the what was the genesis of that? I, well, it's it's a longer story that, that uh, the first Arab Clevelanders come in the late 19th century and they're mostly Christian Lebanese, Christian Syrians, if you will. Uh, and they're part of a national a national migration of Arab. Many of them started out as pushcart vendors. Uh, if you look at Danny Thomas in Toledo, yes. Ohio, his, his family started as pushcart vendors. And so the vendors would go out in the countryside to sell goods and the, the, the depot would be in a city. The newer migration is post-World War II. It is largely post-immigration law change and, and it's driven by the Middle Eastern chaos. You know, it, it is driven by the Palestinian refugee crisis. Uh, it, is, it is still partially Christian, but it's increasingly Muslim that's coming. And so by the 60s and 70s, you're looking at the Muslim population of Cleveland growing. And it centers on the west side. You saw representation happen in the Irish community and the Italian community, in the African-American community. But the newer immigration communities, we haven't seen an Asian council person. We haven't seen a, a person from the Middle East. And do you think that that is something, or do you think that's kind of a bygone of a different era that would indicate that an immigrant community has arrived a la Frank Lauschi, yeah. Celebrisi, Carl Stokes. Well, we, we've seen Latinx. Latinx we have, right? We have Jasmine Latinx. Santana. Yes. Well, I think we're talking about numbers. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but if, if you're going to get a seat in a ward, you have to have enough votes. And, and we may also be in what I call the, some people in a post 9-11 mindset. Interesting. Where, you know, and that's just speculation on yeah, my part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, you know, I can't vote for her or him because they are the other, right? They right. Whatever the other. the other is, right? Yeah, and and I think you know we're we're dealing we're dealing with a nation that calls itself Judeo Christian, Judeo Christian, and everything else right now. Uh, and that was some of the, one of the things that came up after nine eleven was was how were we going to get past being Judeo Christian and embrace the other faiths that are here. So, John, what were the reasons when the local community? decided to leave Center City and move out to the outer lands in the suburbs? Well, there's several. One, it, it, it was getting older. Uh, two, the Center City was polluted. Uh, so environmental three, issues. Environmental issue. Three, uh, you may not have liked who was moving in. Uh, so the four, next generation of newcomer, right. maybe yeah. not your cup of tea. Yeah. And, and four, the most important thing is when electric powered streetcars come in in the 1890s, they can take you out to where you away from the factory smoke to a new place you can have a yard and a lawn okay
John, I want to just thank you right now for what has been an amazing tour of Cleveland. I'm a native born Clevelander, but I've seen a new city today through your eyes and your heart. And on behalf of everyone in Global Cleveland, thank you for that. And thank you for your wisdom and thank you for your humanity and compassion. Oh, thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure doing this. It's uh, Cleveland's been sort of my uh, historical study for a number of years, and I won't go into the years. But taking this bus ride through Cleveland from the east side to the west side just allowed us to touch on so many topics. Some of them are pleasant, some of them are unpleasant, but they're all necessary for us to know, to understand what happens in a community when new people move in, what enriches it, how do we bring these people to become citizens in our community, how will we change our vision of what we are as a community and people as we change. There, you, we've heard of the Marshall Plan, we now have the Grabowski Plan. So John, thank you very much for that blueprint. We are so grateful to you. We also want to thank uh, the incredible generosity of RTA, to the best bus driver that we could have ever asked for, uh, Mr. Darnell, thank you. To the incredible RTA staff, the marketing team that made this happen. Uh, we were saying a little bit earlier uh, that there is no irony in the fact that RTA sounds like artery, which is really the lifeblood of our city and truly the beating heart. So thank you to RTA for just being such an incredible partner, welcoming immigrants and getting people to work every single day. Thank you. Thank you.